Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Dream Catchers, Extraordinary Native American Women. Native American women have inspired many people, regardless of cultural identity, from the earliest contact with non-Native people to the 21st century. The colorful and varied costumes of Indigenous women have resulted in contributions that benefited their immediate and extended communities. Uh, so this presentation will celebrate the lives and legacy of members from various tribal affiliations, amazing individuals who are explorers, doctors, social reformers, and advocates. And this program is led by historian Joanne Tufo, who's a writer, lecturer, and performer who has more than 30 years of experience. Her realistic and haunting portrayals of various historic figures have delighted audiences for more than three decades all over the, all over the country. Uh, and specific to today, uh, Joanne has uh, taught uh, at Coastal Carolina University and their OLLI program since 2012, uh, where she focuses on a variety of subjects, uh, including colonial, civil war, World War I, World War II, and Vietnam eras. And uh, many of the programs that she presents to libraries and other organizations focuses on the noteworthy contributions of women. So all... Let's see, 115 of us, wow. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Joanne for joining us this afternoon. And Joanne, you can take it away, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Robert. And once again, it's a pleasure to be with the, I'm learning how to pronounce it, the Tewksbury Library, because I say it wrong. Um, I am from Pennsylvania, but I'm coming to you from um, the lovely town of Myrtle Beach in South Carolina, which is where I live uh, now. Uh, but I um, have lived in a lot of different places. And I spent a little bit of time in the Southwest where I got uh, to know some of the wonderful indigenous people um, uh, outside of Tucson, Arizona. And that is probably my first real exposure. Although my grandfather said that we did have um, some Native American blood in us, but I think lots of Americans like to say that. I haven't seen any proof of it. I'd be very proud uh, to have that blood running through my veins, but I'm really not sure. Now I noticed that some of you are from um, the Southwest, Midwest, and um, uh, so you may yourself have a little more uh, Native American affiliation. What I'm trying to accomplish today is to really talk about the traditional women who have been associated with um, uh, Native, being Native American women and have made, made contributions, uh, some that you've heard of, and if I didn't include them, I will get complaints. When I have done programs on Native American women and didn't include two particular women, uh, I heard a lot about that. Uh, so there are two women whose names that you're going to really recognize, but there are uh, some other women that you won't recognize. We only have an hour today, so um, that obviously is only a tiny, tiny smidgen of Native American women that truly have changed their world, our world, everyone's world. Unfortunately, in American history, we, um, I guess maybe I should say fortunately, we are always evolving and learning more as we uncover more things, as people become more aware, as people want to look out at others' histories, we really start to expand our knowledge. And so I'm very happy that we celebrate Native American History Month, which is in November. And so I am the final act uh, of what the library has been doing over the last month in their displays and another program that they did. Uh, but this one is just about women. And I'm always excited about the contributions of men. And that has always led me to the question of where does this put me? Where do women fit in this as a gender? Uh, and specifically today, um, the beautiful contributions of our Native women. So let's go to my first slide. And that's me. If you want to reach out to me, you can reach out to me via my email address, which is here, or my um, 
my website, uh, which tells you a little bit more about the other things that I do. Uh, and you're certainly welcome to reach out to Robert if I'm flashing this a little too quickly for you. Uh, my program, as in all of my programs, are presented in PowerPoint and lecture format for the convenience of those who learn. Um, I meant to put um, learn with audio and um, visual interpretation. Uh, so everybody learns differently. Some people read and learn better. Some people listen and learn better. And some people like a combination of both. So uh, um, hopefully you'll find that um, enjoyable. Uh, Laura Thatcher is often quoted in women's history programs uh, and she, said, well-behaved women seldom make history. Well, she's one of a few women that have said it, but she is a PhD uh, in history and uh, uh, a lot of people really appreciate what she has to say. Well-behaved women seldom make history. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you made history, you were probably stepping outside the bounds of acceptable behavior at the time, or you did something that really stood out in terms of women. Uh, that's changing a lot, but for a very, very long time in our history, uh, certainly in uh, United States history, and, and really in the history of the world, in a lot of cultures, women were not the the lead in things, uh, but so much of that has changed. Two other women who uh, said versions of this were Marilyn Monroe and Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, it's believed that Marilyn Monroe said well-behaved women rarely make history and that Eleanor Roosevelt said it as well, but I just think that um, it's a fact. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Um, this is, what the amazing Wilma Mankiller had to say. And I'm going to talk about Wilma, Wilma Mankiller at the end of the presentation, but I love this quote. She said, Western movies always seem to show Indian women washing clothes at the creek and men with a tomahawk or spear in their hands, adorned with lots of feathers. That image has stayed in some people's minds. Many think we are either visionaries, noble savages, squaw drudges, or tragic alcoholics. We were very rarely depicted as real people who have greater tenacity in terms of trying to hang on to our culture and value system than most people. And I think that in many ways, um, Wilma Mankiller is correct, but I think in some ways, well, I don't know if I completely agree um, well, no, I do agree that they're rarely depicted as real people who have a greater tenacity in terms of trying to hang on to our culture. Um, I don't know. I have a lot of tenacity trying to hold on to my culture, to my family culture. Um, so um, I understand, though, what she's saying here. So let's take a look at some just general knowledge here. Um, the Native Apo um, American population, and this is just guesstimates, um, but of course, um, before the arrival of Christopher Columbus, what is now the modern United States of America, was anywhere between 2.1 million to 18 million. That's a pretty large um, uh, field there. Um, in the Americas, it was about 30 million, which includes uh, 15 million Aztec and about 8 million Inca. We know that in 1800, there are about 600,000 Native Americans that were we had hit a low and uh, well, by 1890, we had really hit the low, but um, Native Americans were not surviving the um, infiltration of new cultures. Um, but by the year 2000, that census, 4.1 million Native Americans by 2010 census, 5.2 million Native Americans. And it is projected that in 2050 census, it will be about 8.4 million, which means that Native Americans are really, really becoming conscious of building their tribes back up again. And as with anything, when you are talking about history, there is no 
all or nothing. Um, we rarely get it right. We try to guesstimate an estimate unless there are first person accounts. Historians do the best that they can. And in research, I do the best that I can. I try to come up with the most sources that say the same thing. But if there's anything you see that isn't correct or that you want to add or you think I should be talking about, please feel free to reach out to me. I would love to hear um, your, your feedback on that. So, of course, I have to talk about Pocahontas. And the reason that I do this is because, A, I really think that the story is quite fascinating, although it has a number of incarnations and there is a fair bit of misinformation, but I'll do my best to provide the most accurate for you. Um, we guesstimate uh, that it was between... Um, um, uh, 1595 and 1617 that Pocahontas was alive. And you know, it's all in a name. Um, as we go through our lives, we can get different names, different names in grade school, high school, we add names. I'm Catholic, so uh, I added a confirmation name. So I have a bunch of names um, and I have family uh, uh, names and, and um that certain people call me within the family. So, so did Pocahontas. Um, in her culture, it was common to be given several personal names as well, um, sometimes more than one name at a time. Again, that's not unusual. If your name is Smith, your friends at school might have called you Smithy and people at work, maybe Smitty, and your parents called you your real name uh, or some other name. Um, but anyway, with, um, with uh, Pocahontas's um, culture, she was given, um, people, people were given uh, uh, names at different times and occasions in their lives. Uh, and there is, uh, they were used uh, with different meanings and used in different uh, contexts and changed on important occasions. That's pretty much what I've been saying even about um, myself. So she had Pocahontas, Motoka, uh, and Amanut. Oops. So early in her life, she was given the, the secret name of Matoka. And it was um, very select few who knew the name. Uh, it was concealed from the English for fear that they would cause her harm, meaning that if they knew her name, um, and she was in an unsafe situation, she might trust them, whereas um, that secret name would be a sign to her uh, if someone from her tribe was uh, in need of her or wanted to get in touch with her and um, be known as um, only that person, you know, it was kind of a secret thing. Um, she was also known as Amanut, and none of the, those names can be translated, but uh, her childhood nickname, Pocahontas, means little wanton, and that refers to the frolicsome nature, um, and we, uh, we where did I get this information? Well, an 18th century columnist by the name of John Strachey reported that. So that's the best I can do on that. Um, so her birth, as I said, was estimated in 1595. Her father was a, a paramount chief um, uh, or was the paramount chief and his name was Powhatan. And um, they were from uh, the Senecomica Algonquin speaking alliance of about 30 groups in the Tidewater, Virginia area. Now her mother's name is unknown. Usually what would happen is that the, um, the paramount chief would take wives in, from villages um, and give birth to a child and then send um, the mother back to find a husband and the child remained with Powhatan. And this was a way to make sure that everybody got along well uh, because there was a child right there from each um, village. And of course you would not want to put that child in harm's way. 
through attack or anything like that disagreement. I'm sure it happened, but uh, the whole hope was that it wouldn't. So early in life, she's given this secret name. And as I mentioned before, um, uh, the names can't be translated. So she's often referred to as a princess in literature, but that was really not, she was not in a position to inherit um, uh, as a sub chief or a paramount chief. Uh, it would really go through a matrilineal inheritance. So Powhatan's brothers, sisters, and his sister's children stood in line to secede him. John Smith said this, his kingdom descendeth not to his sons nor children, but first to his brethren, whereof he had three, namely, um, Apichapan, uh, Opachanakana, and uh, Kavita, and after that, to his sisters. So first to the eldest sister, then to the rest, and after that, heirs male and female of the eldest, etc. but never to the heiress of the males. So that's how we know that. So John Smith arrives in Virginia in 1607 with about 104 settlers. And um, on December 16th, he is captured by a hunting party of the Santa Comica. And they take him back and he feasts with Powhatan. In 1616, John Smith reports to Queen Anne that he went to this feast, that Powhatan attempted execution um, by beating his head with a club, uh, and that Pocahontas put her own head close to Smith's to stop her father. Well, we're not really sure about that story completely, except that it may have been a, it could have been literal, um, but it also could have been a tribal ritual that was intended to symbolize his death um, and rebirth as a member of the tribe. So in the Jamestown settlement, Pocahontas befriended settlers and she was just a little one and she played games with all the young boys. And um, it's believed that she may have saved many of the starving colonists by bringing provisions to them. In 1609, John Smith was seriously injured in a gunpowder explosion. He returned to England. Well, the English told um, Powhatan that uh, Smith was dead. Pocahontas stopped visiting Jamestown because of that and later in her life traveled to England only to find that Smith was still alive. So why did they choose Jamestown? Well, it was far inland. Um, so that was a good defense against the Spanish. There was water on three sides, enough for ships. And there were, um, they thought that there were no native people really inhabiting the immediate area. Uh, but I don't know about that because I think they found out differently very quickly. Um, Jamestown, of course, was the first permanent English settlement established in the New World. It was founded by the London Company in 1607 for the purposes of making profit. And that's a rough uh, look of, of, of what you would have seen in um, Jamestown. And you can certainly go there um, it has been restored and reconstructed. Uh, and you can really enjoy that in Jamestown, Virginia, if you've never done that. In the summer of 1609 uh, was the first anglo palatin War. Uh, Pocus, Pocahontas was captured by the English. Apparently she was tricked into boarding a ship um, uh, of Captain Samuel Argyll, and she was held for ransom at Henricus, which was a, a fort that was a little further inland in the modern uh, day Chesterfield County, Virginia. And the demand was that um, English prisoners be released that were being held um, by, by Powhatan's people. And it was a long standoff. It lasted about a year. 
And if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about this, I recommend the Henricus Historical Park. And you can um, just look that up and you can go on and they have information on their website uh, a little more involved about that time. But her treatment during that year that she was being held, historians argue about this. Uh, was she treated with reverence? Probably. Was she raped um, or or? kill or injured in some way? Probably not. And that's because we believe that that would not have been in the best interest of the English colonists. So, um, th but there are various stories about that. Uh, she met John Rolfe during her stay at Henricus. Now, John had lost his wife and child en route to Virginia. And when he decided that he wanted to marry Pocahontas, um, Rolf was concerned about the moral repercussions of marrying a quote unquote heathen. Uh, this was, you know, to, to marry um, one of the indigenous people was not really how the English saw their future. But Obviously, he wanted to marry her. He writes the governor for permission, and he says, I love her, and um, I would be saving her soul. Uh, I would bring her to Christianity, uh, away from um, her cultural beliefs that we don't agree with. And remember that this is a time in history where people are trying to impose their religious will on other people. Some things haven't really changed that much throughout the world, um, but it certainly was a, a big issue in early uh, United States history or during the colonial era. The re how do we know this? Well, this is what he wrote. He wrote, motivated by the unbridled desire of carnal affection, but for the good of this plantation, for the honor of our country, for the glory of God, for my own salvation, namely Pocahontas, to whom my hearty and best thoughts are and have been a long time so entangled and enthralled in so intricate a labyrinth that I was even a, uh, a wearied to unwind myself thereof. What he is saying is that I can't leave her. I've tried. Um, I think that that he truly, and when he says, he says, motivated by unbridled desire of carnal affection, but for the good of this plantation, the, the honor of our country, for the glory of God, for my own salvation, he wants to make this legit. He's already probably dipped his toe into the pond of affection and um, he wants to he wants to legitimize it all, um, but he knows that there's no other way he's going to be able to do it if he doesn't uh, if he doesn't profess that he will uh, change her. So she did a, we do know that she had a Christian conversion during the year that she was held, that uh, Henricus um, minister by the name of Alexander Whitaker baptized her, taught her about Christianity, and she took the name Rebecca. And this is um, a famous painting called The Baptism of Pocahontas by John Gads Gadsby Chapman in 1840. So granted, this is 200 years after the event actually occurs, uh, but it's still something that we're thinking about and we're talking about. And I think it's a really beautiful painting. Uh, and I, I, I think it gives us some ideas about what people look like. Maybe. <laughs> By early 1610, 80 to 90% of the settlers were dead from disease or starvation. So why did this? Well, I'm going to get into why that happened in, in a few moments. But um, basically, it was different people of different susceptibilities and immunities. When they come together, people can get very sick. Um, John Rolfe uh, and left for a bit and then more settlers arrived in 1610. Uh, and by 1612, they were thriving and making a profit. And that's because John Rolfe had introduced a new strain of tobacco uh, to the, to the uh, colonials of the time. Uh, and um, 
they were seeds from other places. So they had never seen this kind of tobacco before. And um, uh, the Native Americans in the Tidewater area of Virginia, well, m more a little more west, uh, were, were growers of tobacco. And this is tobacco at Jamestown in the 1600s. These are the different varieties that you would have seen. And that's just a depiction of uh, tobacco farming. When I was a kid, um, I grew up in the military and at one point we lived um, near the tobacco farms in Maryland. And I had a real chance to study that lifestyle. March of 1614, there was a violent co confrontation between the English and the Powhatan men. Uh, the English allowed Pocahontas to talk to her countrymen. And she told them that her father valued her less than old swords, pieces, or axes. And then she told um, the Powhatan that she um, preferred to live with the English, the Powhatan um, uh, tribal uh, men. And um, her father was out of town. So she was up to some trouble while her dad was away, um, basically said, he doesn't value me. And, um, and um, she wanted to live with the English anyway. Uh, on April uh, 5th of 1614, John Roth married Pocahontas. And this is a, um, another 200, from, from the event, uh, about 200, or more years, 230 years. Uh, she spent the first two years of her married life on his plantation, Verena Farms. They had one child, Thomas Roth, who was born January 30th, 1615. Ralph Hamer wrote this in 1615. Since the wedding, we have had friendly commerce and trade, not only with Powhatan, but also with his subjects around us. Uh, commercial and trade, um, not only wit. So um, things were going very well for this combination of the two cultures. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Rolfe decided to travel to England and they arrived in Plymouth, England in 1616. They traveled to London by coach accompanied by 11. Uh, we'll, we'll just refer to them as Powhatans at this point, but they were, um, uh, that was the, not the name of the tribe, but, tribe, but uh, the leader. Um, and there was one uh, holy man among them, Tomokomo as well. And there's Mrs. Rebecca Rolfe there on your right. John Smith had written to the queen and he requested that Rebecca be treated with respect and as a royal visitor, um, because John Smith, don't get your Johns mixed up, does John Smith and John Rolfe. Um, John Smith said this, if she is treated badly, her present love to us and Christianity might turn to scorn and fury. He also said England might lose the chance to rightly have a kingdom by her means. Very interesting. And that was to Queen Anne in 1616. And this is Pocahontas at the court of King, King James. Reverend Samuel um, uh, Puchas uh, was a writer. And this is what he said in 1617. She carried herself as the daughter of a king. The Bishop of London entertained her with festival state, uh, state and pomp beyond what I have seen in his uh, greater hospital great hospitality afforded to other ladies. Now, Helen Roundtree, who is a very, very respected author and anthropologist, here's the other side of that, said this, there is no contemporary evidence to suggest that Pocahontas was regarded in England as anything like royalty. Rather, she was considered something of a curiosity, and according to one observer, she was merely the Virginian woman. And I think that that's very interesting in that she was seen as an American, not necessarily as a Native American. 
uh, at the time, according to Helen Roundtree. And of course, we have, you know, these things that we've seen that were written at the time, but it's one guy's opinion, uh, Reverend um, uh, Puchas. So we talked about the estimated Native American population. This is another thought on it, that the estimate was about 50 million, but that the population decreased as much as 90% by 1700. So from 1492 to 1700, you've got a dramatic de decrease. Why? Well, the spread of disease, uh, the lack of genetic diversity, uh, contact with the Europeans and Africans, uh, responsible, it was responsible for killing between 50 and 90% of native population during this time. None of these numbers add up, and I know that, but it is very difficult. So, you know, certainly you can go do some research on your own and really look at those numbers, and you're going to see quite diverse. So I just throw them all in there so that, you know, you get a feel for that. Um, let's talk about another lady, a lady by the name of Nancy Ward, uh, also known as Nanye. Um, she was a Cherokee and she was later known as Nancy Ward. She had a, she was a strong political leader for the Cherokee tribe and earned the title of Shigao, which is beloved woman. Uh, and she advocated for Native American women uh, in a period of intense conflict between whites and Native Americans. Intense, 1738 to 1822. That is right smack dab in the middle of the issues. Well, part of the issues anyway. Uh, in her last years of life, um, she had recurring versions of what we now know uh, uh, of, as the Trail of Tears. What is the Trail of Tears? Well, the Trail of Tears is believed to have gone on between 1830 and 1850. Again, you know, give or take with the years. Uh, these were forced displacements of over 60,000 Native Americans. Uh, they were primarily of what was known the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, the Muscogee, the Seminole, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Ponca, the Ho-Chunk, uh, Winnebago nations. And um, this was per perpetrated by the United States government in a way that it is believed to be um, ethnic cleansing uh, that was gradual over the course of two decades. Sadly, her visions were really specific um, and they were really quite correct. So this is the Trail of Tears as the National Park System um, says, and you've got Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, a little bit of on the Mississippi line, Arkansas, and into Oklahoma. And yeah, I said Missouri, and a tiny tip of Indiana and Illinois. Um, Nyanyehe also played a role in the American Revolution. She advocated for peace between European Americans and Native Americans, and she introduced dairy products into the Cherokee economy. She was considered to be a visionary, a staunch advocate, and a fearless leader. So what about this lady, Sacagawea, uh, an explorer? Uh, who lived between 1788 and 1812. So that's the other Native American woman whose name may be familiar to you, but you may not really know a lot of the story. I'm sure none of us know a lot of the story, but we do, we do have some ideas that are consistent through uh, accounts um, by historians over the years. So her name in Shoshone was um, Bird Woman, uh, and, and in Hidatsa, it was Boat Launcher. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how she was associated with both these peoples, but there are about seven variations in the spelling of uh, her name in the journals of William Clark. Um, Sakagawea, uh, Sakagawea, I think that pretty much when you look at the first one, these are all very similar. They're spelled differently, but I think we can 
people of the time often spelt phonetically. Uh, so I rely much more on diaries and things like that that are less formal because really people write the way they speak. So I'm guessing uh, Sacagawea uh, was probably the um, correct pronunciation. So she was born in Lemmy County, Idaho, around 1784, give or take. She was the daughter of a Shoshone chief. And in 1800, we know that she was captured and taken by the Hidatsa um, Indians during a battle. And I just wanna say this, um, the interchangeability of, I usually use the terms Native American peoples or indigenous people. Occasionally, I will um, use the referral as Indian people. <coughs> um, that is a word that's used within their own ranks at times. Um, um, so you'll see me use it once in a while, but mostly I'll use indigenous or native peoples. Uh, and Indians... <sighs> It also suggests ownership in a strange way, the same way we don't use the word slaves anymore. We use enslaved people. Um, so you'll see a little bit of that as I'm talking. Um, so anyway, um, um, uh, Sacagawea is, or Joea, is captured and taken by the Hidatsas. Uh, and she sold as a slave to a man by the name of Toussaint Charbonneau. And he is a French Canadian trapper. Later, he takes her for a wife. So she first is sold as a slave, we think, uh, and then um, becomes his wife. So he was born in Quebec and was a free trader and he obtained goods on credit and traded them with the Indian or Native American people. We know that he moved to present Bismarck, day Bismarck, North Dakota in 1796 and settled among the Hadatsas and the Mandans or Mandans. Uh, and adopted their way of life. And he lived in their cluster of earthen lodges. In 1804, Lewis and Clark arrive at Fort Mandan. And Charbonneau has two Shoshone wives at this point. One is Sacagawea, who is, uh, or bird woman, and then another woman named Otter Woman. And he had purchased them from the Hadatsas. So uh, Fort Mandan Village kind of looked like this. Um, this is a reproduction, uh, an earth lodge, uh, which would be a community task, making the lodge uh, for a family. Uh, there was a platform and that platform would be used for storage and it was raised off the ground to keep the items out of the reach of animals and children. There was a wooden palisade to keep out other tribes, primarily the Sioux, uh, who frequently raided um, Mandan villages. And that's sort of what it looked like inside. On November 4th of 1804, the Corps of Discovery arrived um, for their winter encampment and they encountered the Hadatsa's tribe. They needed someone that was familiar with the language uh, and Native American customs, so they interviewed Charbonneau. Um, and instead they opted for Sacagawea. Uh, she was fluent in Hadatsa and Shoshone languages. Now the expedition dates, um, and the expedition was to really claim the lands of the Louisiana Purchase began at the Missouri River in 1804. Um, by 1806, the expedition reaches St. Louis. It took a total of two years, four months, 10 days. And there is um, Sacagawea with Charbonneau and Lewis or Clark, one of them. 
Uh, in his journal, Clark once referred to her as Janie. He also referred to her as Squaw. Now, that term was not derogatory at the time. It simply meant Nate Amer Native American woman, although today that might be considered a pejorative. Uh, on March 11th, 1805, Charbonneau was hired. And this is um, what William Clark said. He said, we have every reason to believe that our Minotaur interpreter, whom we intended to take with his wife as an interpreter um, through his wife to the Snake Indians, uh, of which nation she is, has been corrupted by the blank companies. Um, some, uh, explanation, I'm sorry, some, they, like I said, they spelled phonetically, some explanation has taken place, which clearly proves to us the fact we give him to night to reflect uh, and determine whether or not he intends to go with us under the regulations stated. So clearly, William Clark uh, and Meriwether Lewis said, look, this is what the rules are going to be. This is what we want you for. This is what we need you to do. Um, we need you to interpret certain things. We need your wife as well. Um, you can think about this and then let us know what you're going to do. They didn't really like Charbonneau. Um, so Sacagawea belonged to the Lemmy Shoshone Indians, also known as the Snake Indians. They were called that because they had this distinctive trait of being able to hide when discovered. I don't know who gave them that name. Uh, William, this is William Clark uh, writing in his journal at the Eagle Creek in 1805. That's just a beautiful painting. And I like, I like to think of him that way. On March 17th, Charbonneau apologized for his behavior. He had just been a really, he had gotten into quite an interaction with Lewis and Clark. And then he accepted the conditions of the employment. He was the oldest member of the expedition at 38 years old. Sunday, a windy day attempted to air our goods. And Mr. Charbonneau sent a French man of our party that he was um, sorry for the foolish part he had acted and if we pleased he would accompany us agreeably to the terms we had proposed and do everything we wished for him to do. Um, he had requested me some through our French interpreter two days ago to excuse his simplicity and take him into the service. After he had taken his things across the river, we called him in and spoke to him on the subject. He agreed to our terms and we agreed uh, that he might go with us. Um, but few, but few Indians here today, the river rising and uh, several places open. So yeah, that it's I even though I've read that a million times, I still struggle with it. Um, he was known though as Mr. Sacagawea, and he was not very well liked. Um, he was a man of no um, peculiar merit, according to Lewis. Um, historians say he was a coward who hit his wife um, and that he had an attraction to young Native American females. And this was a lot of what that negotiation was about. You're not going to be hitting your wife or picking up young girls or whatever. Now, Sacagawea served as a general translator. She would translate Shoshone to Adatsa, um, then to her husband, who translated it into French, to those in the party that knew French. So they really had to go through quite uh, a little ordeal to get Lewis and Clark familiar with what they were trying to say, uh, because it was being translated variously. Um, she gave birth to her first child when she was 16, John Baptiste, well, to her child, I should say. He was nicknamed Pomp. Now, it was tradition for the firstborn son of the Shoshone mothers to be called Pomp, which means a leader. Uh, and she traveled um, 5,000 miles with that baby. 
President Jefferson said this to Meriwether Clark in 1803. To your own discretion, therefore, must be left the degree of danger you may risk and the point at which you should decline, only saying that we wish you en route on the side of your safety and to bring back your party safe, even if it be with less information. So, you know, really, Lewis and Clark are fascinating to read about because of what they had to do to get information. That's what they were on, a fact-finding mission. Uh, and they had they have some very interesting things that you can learn about them by reading their uh, the diary of William Clark. Um, so this was the first United States expedition and they were sent by Jefferson, as I mentioned before, it was to find and explore um, the land that was part of the Louisiana Purchase and to also find water passages for trade and commerce. Uh, to find the Great Northwest Passage. They knew there was one, uh, but they needed to find the route to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, they claimed sovereignty over the territory of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And granted, uh, it is not lost on me that the idea of ownership of land to our native culture was so foreign. It was very difficult for them to understand. You could not own land by most of their estimation. And um, yet people were saying it all the time that somebody gave it to them. They bought it from somebody. Uh, and as I said, they met um, Sacagawea at the um, winter encampment. We know that on June, from June, June 11th to 17th, she was very ill with a fever and that Clark helped to save her life. <coughs> on August 8th of 1805, she recognizes Beaverhead Rock and the headwaters of the Missouri uh, and the home of her tribe, the Shoshone. And um, I just love to show that stamp. We have great stamps here in America and they really do depict our history. And that is, um, that is Beaverhead Rock there. It looks like a beaver's head. They name this Camp Fortunate um, when they discover the Shoshone tribe there. And it's really interesting. You know, she recognizes it. Hey, I, I know this area. Um, Lewis and Clark negotiate um, with the tribe for horses. And Sacagawea discovers that her Shoshone chief, um, uh, the Shoshone chief is her long lost brother. Uh, so that was quite interesting, and the reason it was Camp Fortunate. And I think they were pretty much in bad shape by the time they reached there. They needed horses, they needed respite, they needed to see some kind of a familiar face, even if it wasn't somebody they knew, uh, but that um, Pocahontas knew. And there she is dragging that baby around. Good for you. On September 22nd, 1805, the expedition crossed the mountains after nearly starving to death. And Lewis and Clark um, end up at great, the Great Falls of the Missouri, which this is a great painting of this. And the expedition continued westward following the Missouri River. They traveled by horses, boats, canoes, uh, over the Continental Divide. They kept going. They crossed um, the Clearwater River, the Snakewater, the uh, River, the Columbia River, and they decided to build Phil, uh, Fort uh, Clatstop and stay there for the winter. Uh, the ex expedition reached the Pacific Ocean in November of 1805. Clark sees the ocean and his journal entry says, ocean in view, oh, the joy. In August 14th of 1806, um, the expedition returns to the Mandan village, Charbonneau, Sacagawea, and uh, Jean Baptiste stay, and they part ways with the Corps of Discovery. 
Charbonneau was paid $533.33 and a land warrant for 320 acres. Uh, they ended up living with the Mandans for the next three years. Charbonneau decides to move to Missouri and claimed his 320 acres of land. Um, he did not adapt very well to working the land. And we know that he, in the spring of 1811, he sells the property back um, to, sells it to Clark, not back to Clark, but to Clark for $100. It was the US government that gave him the 320 acres of land. Um, John Baptiste is actually left um, under the care of Clark um, and he's enrolled in boarding school. So there is some controversy. There's a memorial for, there's lots of controversy, but there's a memorial for Sacagawea at um, Millbridge, South Dakota that affirms that she died in, uh, in 1812. And um, the memorial in the Wind River Reservation um, says that she died in 1884. So there's a big difference there. From 1812 to 1838, Charbonneau had many jobs. Uh, he worked with the American Fur Company. Uh, Clark was the superintendent of Indian Affairs at that point, and he hired Charbonneau as an interpreter for government officials, explorers, and visiting dignitaries. And then um, Charbonneau died in 1840 at Fort Mandan. And this is a beautiful statue. Uh, cast in bronze near Salmon, Idaho. And the Sacagawea dollar, first released uh, January 27, 2000. We all thought they were quarters in our pockets. Uh, let's talk about the Santa Fe Trail now. The Santa Fe Trail was a commercial and military road. It was mostly used by male traders, and it was an immigrant route between the United States and Mexico. And the whole idea of people coming up through that route was searching for a better life. Um, females um, contributed to travel over the trail. Uh, so this is... Uh, just gives you an idea of that route. So let's talk about the role of women in the communities along the trail. Um, the, among the agricultural peoples of the Pueblos, uh, the women built and owned the houses. They cared for the children. They prepared and gathered food. They produced pottery and cooking utensils, and they made food. There were the semi-nomadic people, the, the Kanza, the uh, Pawnee, and the Osage tribes. Their women were responsible for garden plots, some food gathering, food preparation, again, making clothes. American Indian and Mexican women not only lived uh, along the Santa Fe Trail, but they traveled on it. And in some instances, they married American traders and trappers uh, who operated on the trail. And this is what that looked like. Among the Plains uh, Indians were the Comanche, the uh, Kiowa, um, the Apache, and the Cheyenne. And in those cultures, the women were responsible for domestic arrangement of the camps, food preparation, and clothes making. Um, she was called Pretty Nose and she was at Fort Keogh and she is wearing uh, the dress and the, the woven belt and the buffalo robe um, as well as a bracelet and necklace. She's lovely. Let's talk about Sarah Winnemucca. She was an outspoken advocate. Uh, she was born in 1844 in present-day Nevada, and her daughter and granddaughter, um, she was a daughter, excuse me, and granddaughter of Northern Paiute uh, chiefs. She learned English and Spanish as a child and um, three Indian dialects, and in the 1870s, she served as an interpreter at Fort McDermott and then on the uh, Malheur Reservation. 
During the Bannock War of 1878, she worked as an army scout and she rescued a group of Paiute, including her father. Uh, some of the Paiute were forcibly relocated to the Yakima Reservation and Winnemucca decided to advocate for Native American land rights and systemic improvements. In 1879, she lectured in San Francisco, 1880. She met with President Rutherford B. Hayes in Washington. And by 1883, she was the first Native American woman to produce a published book called Life Among the Paiutes, Their Wrongs and Claims. And that was in 1883, as I said, that's something to try to get your hands on. Uh, the, in this work, she, made many powerful statements, but this is one of the ones she made. For shame, for shame, you dare to cry out liberty when you hold us in places against our will, driving us from place to place as if we were beasts. The U.S. government committed to reforms, including a return to the um, to Malheur for the Piots. Um, in the end, nothing changed. So that was a tragic end to all of her work. Uh, she died in 1991, but she will always be known as a forceful advocate for her people. Susan LaFleche Picot, um, she was a 19th century Native American reformer and physician, and she has a hospital named for her near Walt Hill, Nebraska. Uh, she is a native to Omaha, Omaha, excuse me, and recognized as the first Native American to hold a medical degree. Uh, she worked for public health and served for the land's legal and formal allotment um, to members of the Omaha tribe. She was very active in the 19th century temperance movement. Um, to prevent drinking on the reservation. She also served as a doctor. Uh, the campaign for the prevention and treatment of tuberculosis, which was incurable at the time. And she continues to inspire Native American women today, especially um, with her work ethic and her commitment to public health. There was another woman known as Buffalo Calf Road Woman. And um, she lived between 1844 and 1879. She was Cheyenne, and she was a fierce Native American warrior. She is believed to have given the final blow to Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn. She was also known as Brave Woman, and she fought along her um, husband in battle and saved her brother's life also. She, her husband, and her children were relocated to present-day Oklahoma after eventually surrendering to the American government. Sadly, she died of malaria. Uh, and at the time, her husband was in prison for fighting and killing a Cheyenne chief. Uh, he hanged himself in prison after he heard about his wife's death. Uh, and the source for that was uh, um, Helena Independent Record. She is still known as legendary um, to this day. Lida Conley, I love to talk about Lida Conley. Um, she was the first Native American woman admitted to argue a case before the Supreme Court of the United States. She graduated from Kansas City School of Law in 1902, and she was the first woman to be admitted to the Kansas bar, not for it's a Native American woman, the first woman. She was a member of the Wyandotte Nation and she was upset by the sale of the tribe's burial ground to the federal government in 1906. So um, the Wyandotte Nation is what was in modern day Ontario. So in the 1640s, that tribe was driven out of their land and they were relocated to Ohio. Uh, most of them had ended up in Kansas by the 1840s, and they established a cemetery um, in an area that's now known as Kansas City. Well, after the Civil War, members of the nation uh, who didn't become American citizens were relocated to Oklahoma. 
And the tribe lived in Oklahoma. Um, uh, they wanted to lay claim to the land back in Kansas. So in 1906, they begin to sell the land to the Kansas government. Well, Lida Conley believed that it was wrong to sell that land and to dismantle the cemetery. So she and her sisters take up camp outside the cemetery and they took turns guarding the land with muskets and they put up no trespassing signs and they wrote to the Kansas City Times in October of that year uh, and she uh, Lida Conley explained that she had the right to defend her tribe's lands. Oops. And that's um, that's Lida and her sisters there. And this is, uh, they call this Fort Conley. It was this little hut that they uh, erected and that they lived in uh, at the cemetery to protect those lands. They were, they were gonna go to war with anybody who tried to um, revert them to anything but what they were. And it was Lida Conley who said, in the cemetery, we are buried 100 of our ancestors. Why should we not be proud of our ancestors and protect their graves? We shall do it and woe be to the man that first attempts to steal a body. We are part owners of the ground and we have the right under the law to keep off trespassers. The right a man has to shoot a burglar who enters his home. She argued for an injunction against the government's authorization of the sale of the land in court. It took her all the way to the Supreme Court and it became the first in which a plaintiff argued that the burying grounds of Native Americans were entitled to federal protection. Like Jacob of old, I too, when I shall be gathered unto my people, desire that they bury me with my fathers in Huron Cemetery, the most sacred and hallowed spot on the earth to me. And I cannot believe that this is superstitious uh, reverence any more than I can believe that the reverence every true American has for the grave of Washington at Mount Vernon is a superstitious uh, reverence. Sadly, she lost the case. Um, she continued to protect the burial ground. And then in 1914, she was arrested for shooting a police officer who entered the cemetery. Uh, she didn't stop guarding the land, even when the land was turned into a federal park. Uh, but it is forever protected from being sold. When she was 68 years old, she spent 10 days in jail for chasing people off the parkland. She passed away in 1946 and was buried in the cemetery that she had dedicated her life to protect. Wilma Man Killer said it should re be remembered that hundreds of American uh, that hundreds of people of African ancestry also walked the Trail of Tears with the Cherokee during the forced removal of 1838-1839. Although we know about the terrible human suffering of our native people and the members of other tribes during the removal, we rarely hear about those Black people who also suffered. And there are so many other noteworthy women but I love to bring, and I encourage you to study Wilma Mankiller, um, 1945 to 2010. She was the first female chief of the Cherokee Nation, an activist, a writer, and a professor at Dartmouth. Um, in the Cherokee language, it refers to a national, a traditional Cherokee military rank, like a captain or major. And in her words, she said, remember, I am just a woman who is living a very abundant life. Every step I take forward is on a path paved by strong Indian women before me. Uh, and this is her after she was elected chief. And I'm gonna finish with Wilma Mankiller because we are almost out of time here. Let's get rid of the share and see if there's any questions, Robert. So Joanne, wonderful job as always. Uh, folks, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please get them into the chat and Q&A now. 
Um, Karen would like to know, are there any known living relatives to Pocahontas? I don't know. Yeah, I don't sure. know the answer to that question, but I think we can Google it. <laughs> Quick, somebody Google that. I'll see what I can find out. Uh, Christine okay. says, wonderful. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, Linda has uh, similar sentiments. Uh, Lisa says, excellent presentation. Uh, Deborah recommends uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, not sure if you've uh, read that book. No, I don't know that book at all. Pat wants to know, how does the name Matoka relate to Lake Matoka in Williamsburg? Any idea? No. No, but I think there's another Google for you. There we go. Lois. And uh, I know Williamsburg, but I never made that. I never made that. Uh, except that it's in the area. I mean, it's in the Tidewater area. So, I mean, she was, that was the area she's from. So that makes sense. Uh, Lois says a uh, very informative. Thank you. And she wants to know, uh, do we know how Pocahontas passed away? And was it at a very young age? Well, there's, it's weird because there's a few different thoughts on that. Um, I think that it was at a fairly young age. It looks to me like she was pretty young. Uh, so I'm not sure it could have been, it could have been disease, um, which so often she had a lot of contact um, with non-Native Americans, but that's another good Google question. Uh, Deborah, um, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, Deborah has a question. I think the question is, is this being recorded? And yes, it is, Deborah. And I will send you the recording via email later. Uh, Pat says, was the boarding school where Pomp was sent one of the notorious Indian, Indian schools or was it a normal one? I think it was a normal one. I don't think it was one of the notorious Indian ones, although there were notorious Indian ones. And um, that's its own shocking history. It, it, it really is. I, yeah, I get, I've, I've had to include that in a few classes. Um, I do a, a class called Girls Gone Wild West. And I, um, that's actually a, like a four or six week class. And I talk about some of those. Um, Wil Wilma Mankiller is absolutely one to read up about because her family was relocated into an urban area. And um, she was like, we didn't know what to do with that. We, like, we lived on a reservation and suddenly, you know, we're in a city and living in poverty and we don't understand any of it, you know, because, because unfortunately like it's really hard to teach about native americans without beating up on non-native americans because whenever i study war of any kind or aggression from one culture to another it's appalling what we will do to one another and um you know this was completely, they did not understand, Native Americans did not understand this whole concept of land ownership and taking land. That, that was incomprehensible to them until they got it. And then they, like, they understood selling humans, which is very interesting. So you can't always say, well, one group is so bad and the other group is so right um, because people are people and they're gonna be good and bad on both sides. It's very interesting. Uh, Lois asks, uh, was Pomp left with Clark because his mom died? I don't think initially that was the case. Uh, Frank says, I, mean, you know, I think it was just for better opportunity. And, mm -hmm. and, and I often wonder if Charbonneau was the father of the child. Frank says, thank you. This was a powerful historical presentation. Uh, Jean asks if this recording can be shared. And Jean, it can be. Uh, we're going to put an expiration date on it, uh, but you will be able to share it. Um, Jean asks, are there any biographies about Wilma Mankiller? And um, yeah, I, did, uh, I think, you know yeah. what? Let me just real quick. I, I actually had that up in a slide. 
Yeah, she wrote an autobiography back in 99. I did look that up uh, called Man Killer, A Chief and Her People. Yeah, there it is right there. You can see it in the share. Yeah. And then also um, last year, there was a, a book that got good reviews uh, written about her. Wilma Mankiller, How One Woman United the Cherokee Nation and Helped Change the Face of America. Uh, it was published November 2021 by DJ Herda. So that's. Yeah. If you want to hear what she has to say, and she had, I mean, she was really a feminist and uh, she was very close to um, Gloria Steinem. And I think I even have a Gloria Steinem quote in here. She said, ancient traditions call for setting signal fires to light the way home for a great one. The fires were lit in 23 countries after Wilma's death. The millions she touched will um, continue her work, but I will miss her every day of my life. Um, she really did some amazing thing for people, although with the contemporary women, you also have a lot of um, criticism of the way they did things or how they said it or what they did. Women get that all the time. You know, if, you know, if we, um, you know, if we assert ourselves in a particular way, sometimes we get a very bad re reputation because assertiveness isn't attractive to some people on women, so. Uh, yeah. So we're going to take a few more questions and try to wrap by 3.15. So last call for questions. Alicia says, thank you. Very informative and makes me uh, learn, makes me want to learn more about uh, Native American women. Uh, Jillian with a question slash comment. Uh, I'm intrigued that you liken your efforts to save your family culture to the efforts of indigenous people to save their cultures against what we all agree are horrendous odds. Uh, please comment. Well, I think I'm so glad you said that, because as I was um, telling Robert before we um, came on this evening, I'm going to be actually doing a presentation um, called Tivoli Abana, uh, a, a granddaughter's story. And it is about my family's history coming to America. And um, I've taught a class about Italian immigration. I've taught classes about Irish immigration, every single group has had this incredible and sometimes unsurmountable and unfair treatment. Um, the ones that, you know, didn't get that so much were the original English, German, Dutch um, that sort of came over. Uh, they, uh, and they were just going to conquer the native people because they saw them as savages. They weren't Christian. A lot of these people were driven by religion. Um, when, so I would love it if any of you are free tonight at seven o'clock, um, you can register this afternoon with the Glen Cove Library in New York. And I'm going to talk about uh, my family history. So I'm really sensitive to it. I can understand why you would say, how can you say, compare your family um, to Native Americans? And all I can say is, you know, after um, doing the extensive research on Irish American and Italian Americans, um, did I see, boy, we can be really, really mean to each other. And then look at Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, look at, again, Italian Americans, German Americans in World War II. Like, it's crazy. Um, and then, of course, you can go worldwide and you can look at, at, at cultures throughout the world, both in the present and in the past, that have also... Um, done horrific things to indigenous people or to immigrant people. That's very interesting. Uh, any other questions? I hope that helped to explain myself a little bit on that. I wouldn't want to be misunderstood on that. Um, well, let's ask one more question. Uh, Joanne, uh, so uh, Gail asks, can you tell us about the recognition of a mixed race um, to belong to the tribe of their Indian line? So in other words, the example she used, if some, someone's both white 
quote, you know, quote unquote, white and Native American. You know um, what? It didn't bother the Native Americans so much. Um, is my understanding, and again, this is tribe to tribe and family to family, but it wasn't really that big of a deal to marry outside the tribe or, or to, marry, to marry a white person, a European. Um, now, if you were going to find a way to connect with an enemy tribe, that might be different if it was a long standing enemy um, situation between two tribes like that, I would imagine would, would have been uh, uh, frowned upon, but it wasn't frowned upon so much. Uh, and I found that surprising when I started to do research. Uh, it wasn't wasn't so weird for the Native Americans. Um, you know, Pocahontas marrying John uh, Rolfe was not that big of a deal to her people. It was more of a big deal to our people, which is crazy. We had to make her a Christian. <laughs> so I think we're going to wrap it there, Joanne. Right. Any last words for the audience? I just want to say thank you all so much. And thank you to Tixbury for inviting me back um, a number of times. I look forward to anything in the future. And, you know, just keep going to your library. And Robert has great recommendations of, of uh, books that you can read there. They've had some displays on, on so many subjects, but they have quite a, a little collection of Native American history as well. And yeah, thanks, Joanne, for the plug. And uh, yes, I have not uh, uh, gotten my act together and um, I'm still in the process of booking for the winter, but we will certainly see you again in the near future. Uh, okay. wanna yeah, want to thank everyone for joining us. Look for an email later this afternoon from me uh, with the uh, recording feedback survey and information about some other upcoming virtual uh, programs. So thank you all so much and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. All right. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. Thanks Bye, again. You're welcome. Bye-bye.